Great. Let's uh, go and start with the second panel. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, uh, after hearing the um, policy perspective on how do we unlock data and reuse data in a more systematic, sustainable, and responsible way, I think it's always good to test it with practice and see what is actually done in, uh, in reality. And more importantly, what are some of the lessons learned? And we have an amazing panel, which also was already introduced by Miguel. But let me briefly uh, reiterate. So we have uh, Peter Rabley, who is the uh, managing uh, partner of PLACE, and we will hear more about PLACE in a second. Then we have Alex uh, Hutchinson, who is the director, founding director of the Data for Children Collaborative uh, based in uh, Edinburgh and working with uh, UNICEF and other uh, partners as well. Then we have Mara Balestrini, uh, who is here uh, at IDB Lab, heading IDB Lab, and also almost heading and all, and also uh, um, behind a really interesting uh, data cooperative that we will touch upon in a second. And then of course, we have Matt Guy, uh, who is the president of Bright Hive and has been at the forefront of data collaboratives uh, for the last few years. And so let me start with Matt, uh, because you've been uh, focused on data collaboratives for quite a while. And actually Bright Hive is one of the only uh, or small uh, pocket of uh, 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 corporations, public interest corporations that uh, are actually focusing on data collaboratives. And so eager to hear from you, first of all, why do you focus on data collaboratives? Why is that the core business of Bright Hive? And more importantly, what are some of the lessons learned and especially some of the lessons learned as it relates to, for instance, the work you've done on education data, but also how do you get that uh, established in a more faster way as well? Over to you, Matt. Uh, gracias. Eh, mucho gusto estar aquí con ustedes. Uh, hablo español, bueno, hablo nicaragüense, pues, se corta de ese. Uh, pero uh, ha sido muchos años de estar allí, entonces voy a hablar en inglés, si está bien con todos. Um, so, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here. I really love the first panel. It's so many great lessons. Um, so, Bright Hive is a uh, cloud data workspace uh, for data collaboratives and data trust. That's kind of what we do. Um, and our goal is to make it so that every group of organizations that that's ready and willing to create a data collaborative can do so uh, quickly, cheaply, successfully, and sustainably. That's really how what, what we're here for. And the kind of primary business motivation, and I'll get to kind of my personal impact motivation for that, uh, is that you know there are so many things that you have to you know, put together and get right for a data collaborative to work. You know, the, the people, the process, the technology, all of it has to just be machined just right to keep it from, from spooling out of control. And, and that ranges from legal contracts to data governance procedures, uh, privacy and usage policies, the technical architecture of restoring, transforming, provisioning the data, um, to all of the really complex organizational and business dynamics, right? Uh, some of the things we heard about in the last panel of, uh, well, I could monetize this data, so why should I share it with you um, if we haven't figured out our business model around it yet? Um, and and a lot of those things are idiosyncratic. They're unique to the context. They're unique to the organizations involved. And and you can't you know systematize those unique aspects. But a lot of them are also the same thing that the data collaborative before you had to do. Um, and, and so we want at least those parts to, uh, to be something where each organization that gets together with others isn't having to reinvent all of those wheels just to get their collaborative going. Um, and uh, kind of my personal journey to, to that goal really started with, uh, I was helping start and run a, um, a fellowship program called Data Science for Social Good, where we were working with a bunch of uh, government agencies and nonprofits and private sector companies to uh, figure out how they could use the data they had to improve some societal outcome, have some sort of social impact. Um, and you know, just to pull out an example, uh, one of those projects was with the president's office of, in Mexico that um, after a lot of data discovery realized uh, they wanted to reduce maternal mortality and they had a bunch of data on 
pregnancies and births and deaths and hospital records and demographic information across different uh, uh, regions of Mexico and realized that that data wasn't at the time being used to inform policies that could reduce maternal mortality. And so said, well, let's, let's go ahead and spin up a collaborative and have this partnership with this data science for social good program to figure out uh, what's causing maternal mortality uh, across different regions of Mexico and what policies could be more targeted based on those different risk factors. Um, and we when, when we would do those projects, there were kind of three big ways that the inability to combine data and share data would impact um, the, the potential for saving children's lives. The first was just failure to launch, that very similar to those initial brainstorming conversations with the, the government of Mexico, we would have hundreds of these conversations each year in preparation for the next year's fellowship. And about 85% of all the projects would die on the vine. Right? They, they would happen before, they, it was clear that uh, given the big idea they wanted to solve for, they couldn't get the data together to make it happen. So there's this huge gap between their, their potential for impact and the availability of data to, to actually answer that question. Um, the second was even if you got the data together and you launched the project, often the constraints and the ability to combine the data limited the potential impact for that project. In the, uh, the case of the project with the country of Mexico, um, uh, at the time, there wasn't uh, enough of the kind of policy and, uh, and compliance infrastructure around combining government data and health data, private health data. And so that team, even with you know, the, the top level blessing of the chief data officer there, um, couldn't combine individual level health records. So they couldn't trace a mother's journey through pregnancy and afterwards. And as a result, the risk factors that they were able to identify were pretty coarse grained, right? So it blunted the impact of the project. Uh, and then lastly, the sustainability um, of the project often suffered, right? You could, they, a, 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 an organization could do an awesome project showing here are the risk factors right now for maternal mortality. Um, and, uh, and they did it with an external team that came, came in, parachuted in, built that model once, but they didn't have the infrastructure in place, the data sharing agreements in place, the, the human capacity in place to be able to rerun that model and decide, make decisions based on it the next year and the year after and the year after. Um, and so all of those kind of three big failings of uh, you know, the missing collaborative infrastructure, uh, for me, were a huge source of frustration uh, and I began reading a lot of the great work that was coming out of Stanford, a lot of uh, uh, Stefan's great work, and, and saw you know, data trusts and data collaboratives as a you know, potential emerging solution for the problems that I saw over and over again in that data science for social good work. Um, so that's really why we founded Bright Hive and, and why we focus on, on, on what we do. Yeah. And, and you, because often that, that initial desire uh, can kind of flag after years of beating on someone's door, can, hey, can we have your data? Uh, you know, you, 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 wanna, you wanna be able to shorten that, that kind of time to impact or time to insight for, for collaboratives. Um, so kind of three big things. And I'm actually gonna use an example from a local example uh, right across the, the river uh, here in, uh, in the state of Virginia. 
here in, in the states. Um, one of the one of the data trusts that we helped uh, get started and and help them uh, manage and maintain is is a data trust for the state of Virginia, where all of the different agencies um, uh, are combining their data to help identify which individuals and families they respectively are serving um, so that it can serve them better. So they can say, oh, I've got a program that could help this family that you're serving right now, and they don't know about it, right? Can we use you as a channel to get, to get them the, the service that they need? Um, and to help them understand which programs are working and actually uh, helping those individuals and families and which ones maybe could could uh, be adjusted or sunset because they're not really doing much for for individuals and families. Um, to get that data trust going, um, there are a few things that were really key. Uh, one was leadership, and we saw this on the prior panel. Uh, there, the state of Virginia has a chief data officer, and that uh, that critical role it's based out of the governor's office. So this would be you know similar to a uh, kind of national chief data officer really having the place in, in the cabinet or, or in, in the president's office. Um, and uh, that critical position uh, said, all right, we are going to do this. We're going to create a data trust among agencies uh, and provided that critical sponsorship and leadership coverage to say uh, both we are ultimately responsible. We are the steward over the state's uh, data and each of the agencies have have their respective control. but we are in the position to help figure out and, and uh, unblock right, uh, boundaries that have come up historically. So leadership was critical. Uh, second uh, was um, uh, building on prior practice or a playbook. So we were able to bring to them a playbook of uh, here's the data trust that we had helped a couple of other states set up before. And then being able to say, hey, this has been done before and it worked among your peer agencies in another place was a huge unblocker for, uh, for the naysayers who said, no, this will never work because that, that leadership could point to it and say, no, it, ha it does work, it's worked over there. And right now they're helping families better than we are. Do you wanna be responsible for you know, um, uh, 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 kind of continuing to, to uh, uh, miss the use of that data? Um, and the third, I think is, is what I hinted at in that last comment, which is continuing to anchor it to the goal. Right. One of the things that leadership did that was really great is to say, this is, this is not about the data fiefdoms. This is about helping families in Virginia or families in Korea or families in Ireland right? and, and continuing to anchor it to the narrative of the impact um, of the collaborative um, helps remind folks that might get kind of mired in the weeds of, of data sharing um, or helps expose sometimes the, the uh, cold, heart, cold heartedness of the maybe private sector actors who are saying, I, I wanna monetize this data. And, uh, and the counter is, okay, you wanna do that at the expense of these families. Um, so all of those things I think are, are um, techniques, right? Um, beyond that, right, we, the, the bonus is once they were able to get everyone to say, yes, we'll sign here, um, you know, Brighto was able to have kind of a plug and play architecture that's been tried and true and tested and gone through all the different stuff. So they could spin up, they could share their metadata first without having the kind of concern of sharing, putting all their data into a big honey, uh, honey pot, but um, at least allow folks to discover what they had um, and then decide what needs to happen in order to have it shared. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, technical detail on how to get, uh, how to grease the skids. But I would say the, those first three things of uh, leadership, um, uh, uh, you know, templates are, are best practice, prior practice, and anchoring to the, the core reason um, are, are the human techniques that, that are most important. So much. So let's go to, to Alex. And I think this is a really good uh, uh, transition because Alex, that seems to be anyway what the Data for Children Collaborative has tried to do as well, uh, of course, in different settings. So tell us a little bit about First of all, what's the Data for Children Collaborative? What's the impetus? And then uh, what are some of the lessons learned and how, does, how do they differ or uh, reinforce what Matt uh, uh, was saying as well? Thanks, Stefan, and thanks for the invite here today. Uh, listening to Matt there, I'm just nodding, going, yes, exactly, exactly. So there's a, there's a lot chiming with me 
uh, in terms of Matt's lessons learned. So the Data for Children Collaborative is an initiative that's in the University of Edinburgh. Uh, we partner with UNICEF and Scottish Government, and we run a portfolio of data and data science projects, all looking at improving children's lives globally. So thinking of UNICEF as one of our main kind of challenge owners, and they bring to us challenge questions. And then our role is to facilitate bringing together the right partners to try and answer that solution. So we work across academia, public sector and private sector to uh, look at how, how can we solve some of these really decade old issues in innovative and new ways using data. And when, when we first started out, we used to just call ourselves, uh, we talked about data science, but actually the learning is really, we, we need to start with data because not everybody's ready to jump into the complexities of data science and AI and machine learning until they've actually got their data uh, kind of wrangled and sorted out and understand their, their ecosystem initially. Um, so in terms of the learnings of working in the Data for Children Collaborative, um, I think, again, back to, to Matt's point, that having a core mission um, and, and actually in, in the way that we work and the way that we facilitate really diverse partnerships, so it's multidisciplinary work, you've got kind of subject context experts working with uh, data scientists or data experts working with public sector and private sector, you're bringing together quite diverse cultural uh, combinations. So even, even if you just strip back to academia, public sector and private sector, what do they all bring to the party? Academia has got that kind of robust way of working, really thoughtful and uh, quite deliberate way of working. Private sector is probably a bit more ambitious and has more kind of, uh, kind of goal-oriented, time-driven targets. And public sector has got that kind of human societal uh, you know what's what's the what's the societal gain here and our one of our key learnings is making sure that each of those contributors who's come to the party to solve that solve a problem facing children that you understand what their motivator is and it, you know you could go back to oh are we going to help children everybody will want to do that but there's got to be something more intrinsic about what their skin in the game is so like identifying that and calling it out and getting everybody to say that right at the beginning so that you can respect that as you're working through the project so that you're always adding value to that individual or organization who's in the collaborative um, means that you're always going to be at like always wanting to move towards the same goal you've agreed on what the challenge is and what you're trying to solve but respecting everybody's contributions is really important um, in terms of other learnings, we've effectively set up a lot of approaches and frameworks, how we work. So even how we bring together those different partners that are working on a uh, collaborative uh, is quite innovative. We do open calls and the way that we get people to talk about how they want to work together. And we break it down to skills rather than solutions to get people to work on, on issues. And the other kind of main framework that we use is called responsible innovation. So Stefan's alluded to responsible working with data. So we have bespoke ethics assessments. We have youth participation workbooks. We have uh, safeguarding training, the legals. So we don't let legal sit in the background and be a 40 page document that nobody's ever really seen. We always draw that up to something that everybody who's working on the project signed up to. And we are, you know, so, but in this collaborative effort of bringing these diverse partners together by going using our responsible innovation framework, everybody is bought in to that value of trying to do the right thing in the right way for children. So much, uh, Alex, and and just listening to um, what Matt was saying and and what you were uh, referring to as well is that. Quite often there is this anyway idea of a data trust is something that you pull out of a box and you anyway you plant it somewhere and you have a data trust right and so but it seems to be what you both of you are saying is that it's actually more of a methodology right that figures out what is fit for purpose in the context that you work um, than it is a single solution 
And so trying to, anyway, am I right in, in, in reading that between the lines? And, and, and again, Matt, feel free to chime in as well, but is that something that, uh, anyway, we really need to focus on and data collaboration as actually a methodology, not just a single solution and methodology to figure out what is fit for purpose perhaps, but, but you do need to anyway, follow a few steps, it seems to me. From our point of view, it's very methodological. So we have a clear set of steps that we take. Even, even that first step we call a true north check is to say, is data even the answer to this question? So to step back and say, are we the right people to help address this question? Is data the right, the right answer? And do we have the right stakeholders in the room? So has anybody actually asked for this? Because we talk a lot about data-driven solutions, but in the Data for Children Collaborative, we actually think of it as demand-driven solutions. So always making sure that somebody has come and asked for something to happen with data and they will do something with the outputs or the insights and that an action will be taken. So very methodological in all of our steps through through the process, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just echo that. You know, it's, it's a little... Um... Uh, cross purpose or at least counterintuitive for for a company that offers a technology solution for data collaboratives. Uh, my view is that you know if you look across people, process, and technology, you know eighty percent of the challenges in making work are, are are in people and process. It's not the technology piece. And there are some really exciting things on the technology side that are making that twenty percent a little bit easier. Their uh, formalized notion of data contracts that you know machine to machine can talk to each other, which is great. Um, but 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 really the the hard work um, is is more methodologically driven. It's it's around people and it's around process. I totally agree. Go to Mara, and so Mara, you're here now at the IDP lab, but of course you have a, a long-standing uh, achievement uh, with regard to uh, Salus.coop probably mispronouncing it, but uh, uh, all right, okay, good. And, uh, uh, and so tell us a little bit more about um, this effort, which I think is interesting because we've heard about data trust, data collaboratives, now we have a data cooperative. Uh, and I think it uh, would be interesting to see, so what, what, what does, anyway, what was sales.coop and some lessons learned and also, anyway, what's the current state of uh, sales.coop? Absolutely. So, um, we decided to fund Salus uh in 2016 which is, uh, we were definitely uh, very, very early. And uh, I'm gonna share some of the, <laughs> of the learned lessons uh, in that regard. But at first I'd like to uh, lay out the, 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 you know, just explain why we came up with the uh, Salus Cop. And um, I, back at the time, it was a whole discussion about the GDPR and, you know, these initial discussions about data. And we thought that, uh, the entire discussion was focusing about uh, around uh, protecting uh, individuals' privacy, and that and it was always proposing a discussion where it was either the state that had to protect citizens and control data flows, or private companies that want to extract value. And that's that's the way. If you look at the problem using those lenses, you're missing a huge part of the picture, which is how internet has transformed profoundly our culture. Think of Wikipedia, one of the most valuable assets that we have. How did it come about? It's people sharing what they have, what they know for a common purpose to share, to create the biggest reservoir of knowledge of humanity. You see how people are increasingly contributing to citizen science and have come up with amazing discoveries that were not even possible at that time and for that cost in the past. The way in which open source has transformed computing systems, making them more accessible. So there's a, we, there's a third way of looking at this, and this is where the commons comes uh, into play. But as we are more educated and more connected, there are ample opportunities for uh, mass collaboration and the creation of enormous impact based on purpose and contribution, all, of course, altruism as well. And without even romanticizing, you know, it, this is happening. And we need to see that this is happening because we need to empower 
this uh, collective agency that, that we have, which is definitely going to have an impact, not just in computing and technology and data, but also in things like energy and food systems. It's going to transform. Think of Web3 and the impact they will have in a society and that federated model of orchestrated governance at the citizens level, and it's really going to transform the way we look at things. So this was our vision. We, I had been involved myself and in Ideas for Change, the company that I led back at the time, with a plethora of citizen science initiatives. And I had seen how people were willing to contribute. So uh, their data for the common good. But we did not have the infrastructures to orchestrate such collaboration and to protect those collectives. And let me just say another thing about health data, which I believe is important because it paved the way for us to think of a cooperative. If you focus only on protecting the individual in terms of privacy, you're missing a point in terms of the collective layer of data. Say over uh, uh, the, 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 the genetic information of over 50% of the American population is in the cloud, not because all of them how they are they, they, their genes uh, sequenced, but because a percentage of them use 20, 23 and me and send their saliva up to the cloud. And every time you're sharing your, your, your genetic data, you are basically sharing your family's data. So there's a layer, uh, there's a collective layer to data, which to me means that if we only focus on the, the protection of the individual privacy, we're, we're missing an aspect. Then the second point, is that the more data we have, the more value we create. But if you only think about private companies wanting your data and you acting as an individual, your bargaining power is zero, basically. Whereas if we help people organize and, and under a, a, govern, a shared governance scheme, their bargaining power is huge. Imagine you have 100,000 pregnant women willing to share their data for specific research under a set of rules that they create for themselves. So this is exactly all these, these ideas that I've just shared with you were the reason why we created Salus Cop because we wanted to create a legal standard for the shared governance of health data that would allow people to collectively set the rules under which they're willing to share their data, who they're sharing it, for what, for how long, and under which conditions, and be protected in doing so. Now, the idea is great. I'm sure <laughs> you, you understand now why. Try to set up a data club in 2016 in Catalonia, in Spain, where nobody had done this before. And so there's where we start, began, a, struggle, first of all, to set up the cooperative and try to, where you're going to be basically protecting and, and, and sharing data. This, 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 this is what, like, just talking to the lawyers about this is like, I mean, like, but what's your asset data? What does that mean? I mean, like, who owns? Well, just that took us a long time. And then when we were, <laughs> when we were done with that and when they have the cooperative, now we are 30 members, each member one vote, and we all invested in this. And, and then there's the users and, you know, what does it mean to be a cooperative member and the user and the different sets of rights that each has and the governance, which is the, what they were saying, the methodology. That was very complex. And then when we were done with all that, we started developing the technology because we wanted to be able to have this centralized system using smart contracts to save the attributions on the data, which is the governance agreement of how people wanted to share that data set. So fast forward a few years, and just to answer the final question that you posted, Saluscope is, is, is alive and kicking, and uh, we've already done a number. So we released our, our app. We have 200 beta testers uh, sharing data over the app and helping us make sure it is very robust from a privacy perspective, but also friendly to users. And then we are also running um, each time bigger scale pilots with research or institutions uh, where citizens contribute to public good research. And next year in May, we will be releasing the first 
countrywide uh, program with funding from the um, uh, from the Catalan Health uh, uh, Service, where the citizens will be able to pull their health records using the the, the European Patient Summary uh, Protocol, plus donate share share uh, social data, their steps, uh, and, and other mental health information. Um, there we're, we're looking for uh, 5,000 uh, participants, and the idea is to research the correlation between air quality, green spaces, and, and health, uh, mental health and well-being. Super interesting and 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 eager to uh, uh, to learn how how it goes and and also anyway it reminds me of um, uh, of course you know the big innovation that happened when Apple released its uh, Apple Watch right was the Apple Research Kit uh, uh, which was really about being able to share you know, your data through the Apple Watch basically and had basically led to a lot of medical uh, research. But the real challenge here was the consent uh, uh, form. And so I wonder how you deal with that, especially uh, because, as you mentioned, too often consent is focused on individual consent. But if you share health data, you actually share anyway, data that goes beyond your own individual. And so how do you deal with that? Within uh, uh, within the work you do, I love that you describe that you mentioned the Apple uh, Watch thing because, in fact, what our app, the Salus app, uh, does it uses APIs to allow you to connect your uh, mobile and, and and IoT data basically, and what it does is that it adds the layer of data governance, the attributes. So how did we do it? We realized, um, so we we're very much inspired by the Creative Commons uh, licensing, of course, um, but we needed to come up with a shared understanding of what our community was willing to do with that data. So we created an online crowdsourcing system called Triam, where we, it was a large scale online exercise. We wanted to be piggyback on collective intelligence to identify under which conditions people were willing to share data. So we created this engine, and what the engine did is presented to the user data sharing scenarios. And it was kind of like Tinder. You could say, under this scenario, I share data, I don't share data. Under this, and we validated 8,000 data sharing scenarios. And we did data mining and came up with the most commonly accepted data sharing scenario. So it was the first uh, crowdsourced data license. And with that, we created the Salus COP data license, which, which establishes five principles. And it's documented and it's a legally binding. And, um, and this is what you abide to when you download the app and when you share your data. And the contracts that we sign with governments and with research labs, they are um, they're binded by that license. Thing. And and uh, and I think it goes back to anyway what I've been advocating for is to go beyond just consent, but actually establish that kind of social license, right? Uh, that actually goes into more collective. And I think uh, um, really super interesting because I haven't seen that many implementations uh, of actually a social license around data. Talking about licensing, let's go to uh, uh, to Peter, and I think this is a super interesting panel because uh, it actually shows the diversity of when we talk about data, right? So we have health data, we have data about children, and then of course we have geospatial data, which is a different category of data, right? And I think uh, the reason why, anyway, we have this panel is because to actually show that there is no, anyway, if we talk about data, we actually need to really understand what data we're talking about and what's the data ecosystem that we are talking about. And so Peter, eager to hear from you because you've been working on geospatial data for a while. And you've identified uh, a real challenge in the geospatial uh, space that you seek to address with a data trust. Uh, and so eager to hear uh, what's the challenge, what's the data trust, and especially also the whole concept, because there are interesting concepts here that are being social licensed, but also the concept of a club good uh, is that interesting to add to the data space. So over to you, Peter. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, Arturo and IDB, for having me. Um, yeah, it's so I'm a geographer and I'm biased. I think geospatial data is the most important thing in the world. Um, 
And it, it turns out various studies have shown that uh, about 70 to 80 percent of all government data, regardless of the government, has a geographic component to it. Um, and interestingly enough, in today's society with our smartphones, we've all become mappers and geographers, whether we know it, like it or not, we are spewing everyday exhaust and location exhaust data and feeding these very, very powerful platforms that, that are up there. So um, I've been around geospatial data for over 30 years um, and as at the forefront of early digital systems for mapping. And so I've seen lots and lots of changes. Um, but we decided to focus on, uh, and my background is very much more private sector. And so the, the what, why, and how always becomes a key driver for me. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the world is changing very quickly. And many countries don't have a good idea of exactly how fast their countries are changing. And I mean, either uh, the biodiversity, the natural systems are changing because of our impact and influence on them, or the urban space, the built space, or the agricultural space is constantly changing. It's, it's never in, in stasis, it's always in, in change. And in order to inform policy or, or make investments, whether government, private sector, or otherwise, you, you actually need good mapping data. And it's interesting that civilization, as we know it, um, has ha had been mapping for well over 6,000 years. We've, we have found clay tablets found in Mesopotamia, where as we moved as humans from hunter-gatherers to the first agricultural societies, first thing we did is map it. We said, who has the right to farm this field and who's doing what, where? So actually it's a thing that we, we don't realize, but it's in our lives and we need this data, um, particularly in fast uh, changing economies. So if you take Africa, for example, Africa is, is soon to be the most populous region in the world. African cities on average are doubling in size every seven years. There's little to no planning. Uh, the, the numbers are astronomical. We just don't have a lot of good data. So the problem is that we don't have a, a lot of good mapping data about a lot of the changes that are going on around us. So you cannot make the informed decisions if you just simply don't know where people live, for example, or how many people live there, or what type of people live where they do. So we said, okay, um, well, why is this a problem? Why are governments not able to map? And there's a whole host of issues. I won't go through all of them, but one of them is procurement. Uh, you know, Government cannot keep up with the innovation in technology. Procurement systems and, and are just way behind, woefully behind. Funding is a massive issue. Um, if you don't fund this fundamental data set, um, then you will always be beholden to someone else to try and produce the data for you. I actually, for me, human capacity is less of an issue. And I know that's surprising given some of the discussion here. But um, we find that there's actually enough capacity. Um, and I've yet to find too many people who went through extensive training to learn how to do their iPhone. Um, there are many ways to be informed and learn these days. Uh, so it's not that I don't want to under-index capacity development, but, uh, but I, we don't over-index on it. Um, and we have this problem of a lack of geospatial data despite having over 3,000 orbiting satellites now in space collecting data. And probably in the next five years, we'll have over 6,000, most of which are now private satellites collecting data. And you've seen them. Um, the other issue is Google, Google Maps. I've had conversations with ministers where they say, well, why should we spend money on maps? I can get it in Google for free. And that's a big problem. And it takes a long conversation. But what it does is distort the marketplace. Because essentially you have this free good where someone says, well, Google's good enough, I'll just go there and I'll look at it. Actually, Google doesn't make maps. People don't realize it. They buy data from everybody else. And, and that was, we knew that, so that's informed our design. So that's the why of the problem. And then we said, okay, well, how are we gonna solve this problem? And it was only at that point that we begin to think about the right structure um, to implement, to solve the what and the why. So how? Well, we realized early on that we needed to create 
a good, a data product for the marketplace that didn't compete with anybody in the marketplace. And the competitors potentially were government, private sector, civil society. So how do you create a good that doesn't compete with any of those sectors? So we realized, it's, okay, we need to create the lowest level of data possible. So in mapping terms, it's just fly uh, equipment, take pictures of the earth and drive the streets and take pictures from the street and do minimal processing on the data. This is really important, defining your data product because when you put it in front of your marketplace, everybody has to benefit by accessing the data and saying, I'd rather you do this than me because I really don't wanna do this. I wanna do something else of more value. So actually we decided to do the thing that no one else wanted to do, which is the really hard kind of boring stuff of creating the lowest level of data possible to enable everybody else to create the juice, the value. Right. So that was the, and it took us a while to go down because I think human tendency is you want to do more. Well, why don't we do this? We should do this. We could capture that. The discipline is to go down and start shedding. No, we shouldn't do that because we found, for example, we thought, hey, one of the data sets we should provide is land use, which is how is land being used? Well, then we opened up a whole can of worms because this whole industry came at us and said, well, who are you to do land use? How are you defining land use? And here we, did, we said, oh, what? no, 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 we're not going to do that. Um, but if we give you the data to enable you to do better land use, oh, that would be good. I'll sign up for that. So that was part of it. And then we realized we could only be a nonprofit. So we are a nonprofit, right? Because as we raise funding and become self-sufficient with funding, and if we have time, I can explain how we do that, um, we realized that we could only generate enough money to pay for operations. Uh, and that would mean that we didn't have to, if I took money from private investment, I would have to create more value-added products up the value chain in order to satisfy my investors. By being a nonprofit, I can just produce that common club good. So club goods are what economists define as something that is excludable, but non-rivalrous, right? So we are, our data is not open by default. And there are many reasons for doing that. And, we, and we've not made some people happy in the open data world, but there's good reason not to make our data open by default. One of it is it's extremely detailed and precise. And we have an example from Sudan uh, with the Harvard Signal Project, which put out high resolution mapping data to be used for uh, where uh, they should have interventions for aid for the Sudan crisis some years ago. And without any idea of the unintended consequences, the data went out and was used for good. Turns out the Janjaweed used the same data and targeted and killed people as a result of having access to the data. So one of the reasons that we're a club, we ask you to sign up to be a member. We validate your organization that you're in good standing. And we ask you to abide by membership rules and conditions, including what is good use of data. And we have a process by which we uh, are able to say, you're not doing something that you, should you shouldn't be doing. And therefore you don't have access to the data. So, Anyway, um, and we charge fees to access the data. The final note that I, I would make is um, around the power of platforms and the original discussion of individual data and the realization that individual data is actually worth nothing to me because I can't do anything with my data. So a large platform that we all know, I won't name, their average revenue per user is about $18 a year. That's how much they make on individual data. And the only reason they can do that is they've invested massively in platforms that allow, me, that allow them to have tiny marginal cost for each additional user they put on the platform because it's super efficient. And this is a mistake people made in thinking that they could turn their own data to something uh, worthwhile as a commodity. You, you just simply cannot because you can't get to the scale. Well, with mapping, 
what governments don't understand often and is a long conversation for us is that the value of the government's data is actually not worth a lot internally or externally and it's a third party that can put multiple geographies together on a platform that can create value for external agents to acquire that that data and that's a really important point because each government can only map itself right argentina can't map brazil good luck trying to do that they might with a satellite but they certainly can't do it at the level we're doing it so we've tried to create this trusted intermediary that can do multiple geographies and leverage the power of the platform for economic efficiency so anyway i've rambled on long enough but uh, there you go Thing. And again, uh, interesting because it does, anyway, uh, complete a level of diversity uh, on, anyway, when we talk about data, what, what, what are we talking about? And again, there are different types of data, but I do have a fo two follow-up questions. One is, anyway, so you call yourself also a data trust, right? So what, I mean, in the past, I always made a joke is that if you, anyway, there's a lot of discussion about data trust, show me one and then I will know what it is. Um, but you are actually a data trust. And so tell me a little bit about what that uh, entails. And then the second uh, follow-up question is really about what's currently happening in the data for good space. As and some of you might have seen, anyway, in the past, there was a lot of kind of volunteering, whether it's Meta, whether it's AWS, or whether it's Twitter. And so you might have heard <laughs> that uh, things are changing uh, in those platforms. And uh, a lot of the Meta data for good initiative basically has been eradicated. Twitter, we're not even talking about. AWS is also scaling down. and so. What does that, anyway, what are some of the lessons from those data for good initiatives, right, which were basically corporate social responsibility initiatives uh, for making this more systematic? And, and is, anyway, for instance, the, the place concept, is that actually a different model for data for good? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, so the technical piece of the trust is, is always based on the jurisdiction, legal jurisdiction in which you base the trust. So we chose England and Wales because England and Wales has a very long history of um, assets in trust. Um, whether it was a, you're a wealthy English lord that owns half of Scotland and, is, and you don't want to give it to your son, so you put it in a trust. Um, but there's growing recognition that you can use the legal framework and the specialized courts around trusts and put data as the asset into the trust. So we've created... Uh, an endowment, a legal endowment as a trust where all of the data that we collect is bound into the trust in perpetuity and is stewarded by, stewarded by an independent board of trustees. And they have a golden vote and control that that data can never be sold en masse to a single or any commercial entity. That it must stay in the trust for the purposes of, of a, a public good through this membership that is maintained. So uh, we're doing this now because our idea, our thought is, as we collect more and more data, it's not of real interest and value now. So good behavior is easy to come by when things aren't worth a lot. But when things are worth a lot, that's when bad behavior tends to show up. So we're trying to plan ahead and say, in the future, this data could be worth an awful lot of data, um, money. How do we ensure that it doesn't just go off once into a private hand and be used as a private good and get locked away? So we've tried to ensure in perpetuity this, uh, this, this sort of public purpose. So that was the, the legal underpinnings that we did. And we, we looked at a number of jurisdictions, including Switzerland and Quebec. Quebec is actually doing some very interesting stuff with data trusts. Um, and they have the blending of civil law and common law as well, which makes it a little more interesting. But um, to, to your other point, I think this, this notion of stewardship, um, you know, the problem for these private platforms is they can change overnight. It's all very well now that it's, it, it's beneficial and you can call it data washing or whatever else you want to call it. Uh, it's all very convenient when it's sort of good or it deflects from other bad behavior that might be going on. In, in our notion, in our, part of our thinking around our data trust was the understanding that actually Meta, Google, Apple, Apple doesn't want to use Google Maps and they can't because if they become reliant on Google Maps, 
Google could change the licensing terms and pricing tomorrow. So they would be beholden to a competitor. So actually what happens is there's no market efficiency to privately map the world because they're all mapping the same thing and it's expensive and they're doing it over and over again because they can't rely and trust on each other to, sh to use their base map data, you see. It's why Mercedes will not put Google Maps in their cars. They're using a third party location service provider who they know is not going to compete with them because they don't want to spew all their data to Google as a result of the terms and conditions. Um, and mapping, if you look, you've got Microsoft with Bing Mac, Maps. You have Snap. Um, I don't know if you know Niantic Labs, but they're one of the largest mapping companies in the world. Niantic Labs is the company behind Pokemon. So augmented reality, virtual reality are driving. So it's huge money. But what we saw was a market failure, even for private sector firms, that they couldn't get to scale. There was an inherent inefficiency and lack of trust. So if we could create a third party that created standardized data they could rely on, actually Google's told us, we're happy to spend 20 cents of the dollar we would spend, knowing Meta is also spending 20 cents on this club good. So feel free to ask questions uh, from the audience. Otherwise, I can anyway ask multiple questions here as well. But one, um, going back to uh, the panel as a whole, perhaps, is of course the the question on bringing it back with the first panel. So what are the policies, right, that you feel are needed to actually enable both data collaboratives, as Matt and uh, Alex have defined, or the cooperatives? as uh, Mara has been experimenting with, or the data trust that uh, Peter has been developing as well. I mean, in my, it's not much <laughs> where you could actually go for a data trust as you define, right? Um, um, but um, so yeah, so eager to hear what are some, so for instance, again, the audience here, it's mainly, of course, anyway, uh, governments and in Latin America, uh, eager to perhaps advance uh, data collaboration. What are some of the kind of forward-looking policies that uh, uh, should be established to allow the, uh, the activities in a more systematic way that you are doing? So that's the question. And I, I posed the question long enough for you to start thinking <laughs> <laughs> so that now you have an answer. So why don't we get to Matt? All, all right, I'll, I'll give it a crack. Um, so. Uh, I think Peter brought up a really good point. Um, you know, early in actually in BrightHive's history, we were all in on data trusts as the solution. So we said, we're going to templatize the legal contract of a data trust. And we ran into what Peter indicated, like the, the ability for data trust to have any meaningful enforcement is very, very uh, contextually specific to the legal regimes of that country. And so we were able to do it in a few countries. We were able to create data trust templates for a few countries that had trust law well established and where there was some initial precedent. Uh, but for the long tail of countries, there just wasn't anything there where the at least the legal construct of a data trust made sense. Um, and, and so templatizing something a little bit more flexible to other legal regimes like a data collaborative as a conceptual container that can have some you know legal meaning in the contracting language of that particular country has been uh, has been really key. Um, so I think that's one of the first things, just recognize the legal limitations and the policy frameworks that your country is currently working with around data and around assets generally that could apply to data. Um, beyond that, I think there are both cultural and then specific policy things that can support. So one, when we go back to that, the role that leadership can play, one of the things that we've seen both at the country level as well as like the state and local level is uh, shifting actual the, the cultural practice within um, the uh, data agencies or the data leadership of an agency to going from a um, kind of restricting first mentality to a sharing first mentality where, and uh, we've seen 
uh, this doesn't have to be encoded in a specific policy that passes by legislature, but it does have to be articulated very clearly as a priority by leadership as they come in, where they say the default is sharing. You have to tell me why you can't share if you don't want to share it. Um, and we've seen that as a critical first step that you can, wherever, you know, whatever country you're working with, leadership can start today in doing that. Um, second is we've seen, um, I, I gave a couple of examples. Um, one is the state of Colorado, the other is the state of Virginia. There are two different examples of using policy to drive collaboration around data in different ways. Um, one is legislate the outcome. So one of the hardest, one of the highest valued uh, things uh, for collaborating with data in, in the education space is being able to measure the return on investment for education. How much does investing in getting a nursing certificate uh, lead to actually getting a job in nursing and how much does it pay over time? And that requires combining data that a, a university might have or a training provider might have with data that perhaps a social security agency might have about future wages or an unemployment agency might have or the individual employers or a private platform like LinkedIn might have. And what Colorado did is they said, we don't care how you figure out how to do an agency, but there is a new law in the books that says every training program that is supported by the state of Colorado has to have publicly available return on investment information. Um, and it has to be by year X. And, and that, uh, that mandate said, we, you know, they, they, it gave them flexibility on the how, but it said, you know, the what, and, and, and there was a clear why for it. Um, and that led the state to create a data trust that could do that. Um, uh, the state of Virginia mandated participation. Right? They mandated membership in the club. So after the initial test of the state's data trust, they said, okay, this is valuable. This is, but we are, we need some of these laggard agencies who are waiting around the wings to actually join. So the legislature passed a law that said, okay, every agency is mandated by the end of next year to have their data shared into this data trust. Um, and both, both have been incredibly effective, mandating legislating the outcome or legislating participation. Uh, I absolutely agree. And uh, just, just two cents on this. The first one is um, data sharing by default. Uh, that sh from a policy perspective, that should be a guiding principle. And uh, I'll tell you something. When we began conceptualizing uh, Saluscope, we thought we used, we used the proxy of data of organ donation. You know, Spain, it's a leader in organ donation. And so we were thinking why if people are willing to, to, to donate their organs and saves lives, how can this thinking help us conceptualize Salus Co-op as an instrument for uh, data donation for the same principles? Now, one of the reasons why Spain is the leader for data donation is because it's an opt-in system by default. You have to opt out. And, and that has had a huge impact among other things, among other things. I mean, and this, uh, of course, this uh, shows the, the cultural, how, how certain cultural principles and things may have an impact on how you, uh, on, on the governance models, because this, you know, can be unacceptable for some people. And so, um, the, so the, the first thing is how you conceptualize this sharing principle by default. The second one is having legislation like the GDPR that makes it uh, mandatory for anyone who is collecting personal data to make that data accessible to the legitimate owner of the data, which is the person behind it. If we do not have, so for our model, it's, it's different from uh, the model uh, run by place for, for obvious reasons. We at Silas Cobb, we do not keep your data in a centralized um, cloud. You, this, each citizen that is a, a user, that is a member, keeps their data in their own devices. It's more of an edge um, approach. And what, you, what we do is we keep the catalog of the data that is available in the system and the attributions. 
under which conditions you're willing to share that. We will only perform a data transfer using uh, decentralized protocols once there is a data agreement. Okay, so uh, for, for a system like Salus Cup to be feasible, people need to have um, access to their data sets. And the more access they have, because they can request that the, their data that's being collected is given to them in an interoperable standard format. You know, it's, unless we have that, we have no, uh, no input, right? So how can we help? Um, we have that in, the, in the Europe. Well, I think we can have, we should have that in Latin America and the Caribbean as well. Um, what about the sharing agreements? I mean, because quite often here is also, it's like, you, know, have, you automated some of that. Uh, so is that, you know, and clearly this might not be a function of government as such, because it's quite often contractual. But at the same time, you know, there might be a role there to actually advance some of the standard agreements that, you know, would facilitate some of that sharing or new kind of licenses. Do you feel? No, we have our own social license and we sign contracts with the entities and then the the the, the, the way the technical system works basically uh, all the data uh transfers get registered in the blockchain so they're auditable so you can know who acts which so to become an uh to become a party that's access uh, that can access the data or transfer data you need to download the app and create basically an identity, self-sovereign identity in your mobile phone. And then that allows you to pair your identity with the data set, which means that you exercise your sovereignty over the data, and then the data transactions get recorded in a public ledger. And that makes the data transfers auditable. So um, just reflecting on what Mara was saying about the cultural context of policy setting, and I think that's really core to certainly how we think about stuff in Scotland in the way that Scotland has been looking at data and AI and digital. We've got a strap line of ethical, trustworthy and inclusion. And that, I think that's really reflective of us as a society. And, uh, you know, who's to say that even England would do the same as us and there are next door neighbours, you know, who should be culturally aligned. Um, but a, a lot of the focus, therefore, I think we maybe have been a bit slower in thinking about policy because we want to be very careful and thoughtful about how we're implementing change in terms of data and digital. And we've just recently written a report in Scotland around ethical digital nation, taking in expert comments around the risks associated with digital and innovation. And I think even we edited that report and even reflecting on experts in that field, there's so much caution. Here's what can go wrong. Here's what can go wrong. And it's, you just hear the kind of the risks rather than the practical, And but this is what we should do to make it go right. And that's where policy steps in. And I think in, from a Scottish point of view, we haven't gone far enough. And that's why that report was written is what are, what are the levers that we need to use in terms of regulation and education and support to businesses, civil society? What's everybody's role within that? We've, we've got work to do from a policy point of view, and we will need to collectively look at how to do that together in a cultural context. Follow up question. Um, the data collaborative also works globally. Right, so I mean, you have initiatives in Cote d'Ivoire. You have like, so, so I mean, clearly in Scotland there is work to be done. Although I do recommend everyone quite often looking at you know, data policy to look into Scotland, especially the AI strategies is really uh, interesting from my point. But um, but also, how does that work out in other countries? Right, and of course, anyway, if you work with UN agencies, it's kind of a different ball game altogether. But uh, at the same time, and even what's their role in policy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so working with a UN agency, any form of legal agreement is going to take you at least 18 months. That's the lesson learned in our three years of, of existing. Uh, so we, we try not to do legal agreements with them. We try and keep them out of, we've actually got a flowchart where we're like, what route can we take where UNICEF aren't legally engaged in this activity? They're the challenge owner, they want us to do it. 
but we can just try and uh, negotiate the legals outside of the agency. Um, so, I mean, we've got a bit of a joke within the collaborative about saying case by case basis, because it basically means we don't know what we're doing at this exact point in time, but each project that we do, we have to think about separately. So where I've mentioned methodology, there is a point in time when you're looking at legals and IP where you have to take it out and stop and reflect and, and think about how to do it individually, particularly if it's country by country um, basis. Global meaning, so the big discussion, sorry, Peter, I know you want to chime in, but uh, uh, would a global data governance regime uh, help? Uh, that's a big discussion at the moment. A global standard so that we don't have that case by case that no uh, well i whenever i'm thinking about data and how how you how do you run data i always think about driving licenses and how we all drive on roads and cars and the fact that we have our own national way of getting a driving license and then that's usable elsewhere we, you know, our ethics assessment within the data children collaborative is based around driving. So we have a compass, so our kind of guiding values. We have a roadmap that gets us through the assessment and we have a highway code that tells us all the background information about how we should be following that roadmap. I think like you can broaden that concept out more widely to say what's appropriate within your country, your context, and how transferable is that to other countries and contexts? Peter, any policies from um, from your end that um, well, we're lucky in uh, in terms of geospatial in that we have the uh, law of outer space, which is based on the United Nations uh, Commission of the Law of the Sea. So actually the guiding law for outer space is based on the law of the sea. So uh, we have over 132 countries have signed up for the law of outer space, which defines a communal mapping or mapping of individual countries by other countries through space, uh, which all came about as a result of the uh, Cold War 60s when all the satellites started going up and, and both Soviet Union and, and the US were taking pictures of each other. Um, so we have a common legal underpinning, which is actually useful for us. The other thing we do is that we sign an MOU with the government so that what we collect is authoritative and we give them the data and it's owned by them. That MOU is signed according to their legislation, but the license that they give us is actually bound by the laws of England and Wales. And that license is for the copy that we put in the trust. So we've tried to work our way around non-standardized legal things by agreeing to the laws of the country for the MOU, and then for the license for the copy, it's standardized around where the trust is based. So that's sort of how we engineered. The other question that you had, I think, as we think of South America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, the, the big, obstacle I think for us and our mapping is, um, is military concerns, which are significant, particularly in Latin America and South America. I've actually had conversations with a country X who says, I don't want country Y to look at my data, right? And, and they may use it to invade me. I mean, I've heard all sorts of very interesting things, but many of these countries actually haven't mapped themselves and now they're being mapped from outer space. So, you know, one of the things we spend time on is having a conversation to say, it is inevitable, your country is being mapped whether you like it or not. How about taking some control and doing it in a way that gives you some ownership? Um, but it takes time because it's a highly conservative environment when you're dealing with the IGNs, which are the national mapping agencies of uh, Latin American and South American countries. And I've even had it in the Caribbean. I had one Caribbean country tell me they didn't want another Caribbean country having access to their data. For what reason, I have no idea, but that's just the mentality.
like, but the um, um, uh, and I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. But uh, I don't know whether there are any questions, um, um, Arturo, whether you have any. I had one, but I, I don't know if there's time for it. Um, we're, we can we're way, perhaps we're can go. Time. I think it's mainly for the people online, of course. But uh, I think we can probably go for one question, and then um, one question, question for each. Close. Um, One no, question for <laughs> no, I, I'll try to summarize. I mean, I like uh, uh, and I like to mention that because that's how we opened, and you know, I don't want it to be lost uh, in in this very good uh, discussion. But I, I I do like the idea of this being uh, uh, the product is a process, right? It's not uh, the 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 collaboration itself, but it's the whole process. Question I had was uh, for those that are not um, sort of by definition um, um, exhaust the, the the whole data. Uh, for example, in Mara's case, uh, and you mentioned Wikipedia. So Wikipedia also uh, runs by the 1991 law, right? So very small percentage is the actual contributors. So how do you um, guarantee or how do you control for that potential bias that the uh, volunteers or, or collaborators that are willing to give their data uh, may have with respect to those who don't? Um, and the same you know, applies to to maybe uh, some of Alex's um, uh, instruments, and and the other question, and, and this is the last one, uh, is on the on the club good, and I I think we've had this this discussion before. Is um, the club model, of course, assumes a club right with with assets that are non rival but are non also um, you know basically replicated. Uh, so talking about trust and non rivalry in data. How do you, or in your experience, how um, usual or how much you have to also be aware of potential malpractices in terms of people just gathering the data, taking taking it from for what it's worth today, and just you know take out. Yeah, super interesting point. What we're trying to do is to move beyond. The, the petite committee uh, of altruistic people who want to do this and become uh, more mainstream by making it way easier for people to engage and to share their data. And this can be done by uh, enabling, establishing collaboration with the, the research groups and the hospitals and the institutions that post campaigns that uh, um, engage the broader public. And this is what uh, we were discussing here uh, before where Alex was mentioning it's the purpose. It's not the data, it's the purpose and it's the objective. So this is the reason why partnerships are absolutely crucial. And another thing that we're doing is partnering up with existing cooperatives that uh, can help you know, uh, get all these people who are members involved and create uh, exchanges so that it's easier for them to be onboarded and, and, and share their data. But this absolute uh, need to move beyond and grow, otherwise we won't sustain. I would, I would absolutely advocate for that. So within our data collaborative work, when we're looking at a challenge question, I think more we're moving more and more to a model where an equal expert is the stakeholder, the context expert. And if that's young people, in some cases, in some cases it might be UNICEF being the on the ground member um it's uh we need to value ground truth as an expert alongside data science expertise or substantive expertise bringing the voice of the human in is really important Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, 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 Matt, I'll uh, just why add, don't you answer the question as well, and then Peter can answer the good, bad behavior question. I'll just add one additional concept from, you know, learnings um, that, you know, when you're, if you're trying to get something up and running for the first time in your country or in a sector, uh, it can be tempting, say, we're going to bring all of the people to this table. Right, and we're going to try to make it work for everyone everywhere all at once. Uh, and that, I mean, seeing plenty of successes and failures, we've seen that's the highest f failure modality. Um, so one of the best places to start is with what we like to call uh, a minimum viable coalition. 
which is if you've defined the question of the data product you want to build, what's the smallest number of organizations that can get you the first version of that data product that's actually valuable? And that and no more. That's all you need. Um, and if you start with that set, you can grow from there. You can add additional collaboratives. You can add additional partners. Um, but uh, it's very, very hard to unwind uh, a, a process that's spooled out of control um, by having too many folks at the table at the first. Yeah, so I, I spent eight years at Omidia Network, which of course is Pierre Omidia and that's eBay. And it was fascinating to learn how eBay set up how you drive good behavior. Um, and a lot of it was based on shame and rating systems. As they grew bigger and, and more sophisticated, they were able to identify that pretty much there were always 5% bad actors. In general, 95% of the people on the platform behaved well and, and decently. So I think we take that approach. And as we get going, we're not over-engineering for the 5%. As we scale, we need to be aware that there's 5%. So how do we have procedures and processes? And how do we use our members to effectively rate and, and shame some of the members who might have behaved poorly? And there'll be always someone who behaves poorly, takes some data and runs away. Fine. You know, it's just some leakage in the system always. Uh, and you'll just never stop it. Uh, the other thing is keep listening to your customer. Like, you know, what do you want in the data? Are we making the data convenient? Is it what you want? Um, are we doing too much? Are we not doing enough? And so we've set up working committees where members can be on a committee and have a vote on uh, product definition, licensing, uh, membership fees, uh, and those things. So it's not just us imposing them. So I think, uh, you know, you have mechanics that you can employ. Wonderful. Well, this is the end of uh, uh, this morning session. And uh, Matt, uh, Mara, Alex, Peter, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom and especially also the uh, lessons learned of quite a long period of uh, trying to figure this out. But it seems like we are going into the right direction. And I think it also uh, ends the day, uh, the morning very well by actually looping it back with the morning where actually policy and practice need to be considered together in order to make uh, uh, progress. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks again, Arturo uh, and uh, um, the team here for, um, for making this happen. And uh, I hope thanks also for all those that have joined in the room and online. I uh, hope that this was a, uh, as valuable as I thought it was valuable to me uh, in uh, learning all the experiences. Thanks so much. <laughs>